Um, it's now my pleasure to welcome one of uh, our city's most influential journalists, uh, the Herald's Sydney editor, Michael Koziol. He'll be leading our next panel session. And just a reminder, everyone, to shoot through your curly questions for Michael and the panel on Slido. I'm sure he'll look forward to hearing from you all. Please put your hands together for Michael Koziol. Thanks, Belinda. Thanks very much. Um, uh, keep the applause going, if you will, uh, for the panel, um, uh, and it's a great one. Uh, Stephanie Barker, the Head of Strategic Planning at the Greater Cities Commission. Joshua French, Chief Executive of Greater Sydney Parklands, which of course has Centennial Park, Parramatta Park, Callum Park, Western Sydney Parklands, all of those. Uh, Judy Hannon, the Independent MP for Wallandilly, the seat of Wallandilly, and Alex Wendler, the Chief Executive of Landcom. Please welcome them. Um, and yes, of course, um, do keep the uh, questions coming into the Slido. I promise I will get to them uh, and promise to wrap up at two o'clock as well. I know it's after lunch, so um, my job is to provoke. I'm going to try and provoke us out of our uh, post-lunch uh, sort of lull. Um, not, that they're, not that we're in one, um, but just to avoid that. Um, and I'll, um, I'll start uh, probably with um, Alex, um, only just out of... Uh, Newsworthiness, of course, we know that the uh, Tuesday's budget um, handed Landcom uh, an extra 300 million or, or proposes to, um, and the plan for that money is to build 4,700 homes, um, about 1,400 of them to be quarantined as uh, affordable housing. Um, now, I read the budget papers, um, and they say that those are to be delivered by 2039 40. Um, a lot of people have pointed out. It's a pretty long time away. Um, does that, I mean, does that time frame seem right to you? And 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 why so long? Okay, no, thank you, and thanks for for inviting me today. It's a great it's a great topic talking about up and out, and um, yes. So we have been, and the minister said this before. Um, there is a renewed ambition for Lancome. There is um, more money to 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 back this up, and. What we're going to do with the 300 million is we are going to focus on infill and government land. Government land means, just to, just to really explain the complexity of that, is it means that we are transforming land that was for decades in another use, operational use, and we're making it available for homes and for housing. And what we're going to do is we're as well making sure that we work with other developers to to, to make this land available for, for, broader, for broader development. But coming back to the numbers, Michael, the, the numbers that are out there are really just reflecting what will happen with the 300 million when we invest them in a first, kind of in the first, into the first developments. What will happen in reality, because we are a business and we, are, uh, we, are, we will recycle that money through. So therefore, um, we, will, we will have many more homes delivered over that longer period because we will be able to recycle that money. The numbers that are in the budget papers just reflect the initial results out of the first, uh, first set of developments. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and, and, I mean, I guess the other thing is, um, you know, people pointed out it's, it's not a huge quantum. Um, we've seen uh, a big announcement in Victoria this week. We've seen Victoria announced, I think it was $5.4 billion for um, uh, you know, social and affordable housing, housing builds in 2020. Yes. Um, it, at the end of the day, in order to get more housing, yes. is the government just going to need to put in more money? Yes. And let me just quote a number before that I heard about the 90% will be still delivered by the private sector, right? So this is something that we, like our activity, just to maybe explain that a bit, Michael, our activity in the market is important to unlock opportunities for the private sector. There was, an, there was a, a reference before from the mayor of Liverpool about Ed Park and Fraser's. This is actually a Lancome development. We took that land from the Department of Defense. We developed it, we master planned it. We got Dawa in, we got, um, got Fraser's in, and we got other developers in as well. 
And that's sa the same thing that we have done on Green Square as well. So the, 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 main, the main really role of Lancome is to unlock government land and therefore make it available for other users. So if you therefore go back to the, to the 300 million, there is a reference to infill, and we can talk about that as well, and there's a reference of government land. Mm. And, um, and another quite important role that government plays um, is oh, that, that we as a government-owned developer, commercial developer play, is to do um, projects to show what is possible in the market. So let me talk quickly about the BTRs, the build to rents in the regions. Because why are we in the regions? Because nobody else is in the regions doing BTRs. We're talking about, you know, we see the BTRs popping up in the center of the cities, but we are in the northern rivers and we are in the Naura Bomadari area to, to, to show that it is possible to do it there as well. So therefore, coming just to, to, to finish that, that, that question is, it's not about us doing everything, but us doing an important part to unlock opportunities so that everybody else, developers here in the, in the room and, and everybody else in, in, in the state uh, can work together. Cool, and I should say to everyone, feel free to jump in, go nuts. Um, it's, the, it's, the end of the, it's the end of the afternoon, so that, you know. Um, feel free to, to, to jump in whenever you want. Um, Steph, uh, let's just talk about some more numbers. Um, uh, you know, we've heard the very big numbers today, 375,000 um, homes over five years, and then it has to keep going after that. We all know about those numbers. We know you're working on this new round of housing targets um, uh, to work out where these homes are going to go. Can you tell us, how this round of targets is going to be different from the current ones. Thanks. Um, well, look, everyone's interested in the targets, and I think the Minister talked about it, well, and um, Minister Scully and indeed Minister Jackson, about a sustainable approach. We need a systemic change that's going to set us up, not just for the next five years, but into the future, into the medium and into the longer term. So moving to a more programmatic approach where we've got good visibility across greenfields, across infill, across the big complex urban renewal projects that we've got, each of those needs a really deep understanding, looking at how the different housing market works across areas. You know, we've heard today about there is demand in greenfield areas, there's demand in, you know, inner areas. How do we make sure we've got transit-oriented development? So all those layers feed into the targets. It's quite a complex thing. Take me the rest of the afternoon. To <laughs> no, no, well, no, we wouldn't want that. But um, uh, Je Jeff Roberts, who um, obviously uh, left as, um, or finished his term as um, Chief Commissioner of the Greater Cities Commission uh, at the end of June, he told me in an interview when he was leaving, look, you know, some areas, councils, precincts, whatever, are going to have to double um, or maybe even triple their housing targets. Can you tell us which ones? Oh, I'm not going to go into specifics now, but look, the really interesting thing in doing the deep dive into uh, work on the targets is there's a lot of capacity, but we don't set ourselves up for success. So we've got infill development where you have to buy three lots instead of two and consolidate them, making it twice as hard for that to happen. Where we uh, have got complex planning controls and different decision making points that we need to pull together. So there's uh, quite a few elements where I think people would be surprised just how many places already have planning capacity or indeed strategic plans in place to get that growth. And then looking at how we can look at opportunities where we already have existing infrastructure that isn't being optimised. So they're prob that's probably a bit of a clue where some of the some people could be doing, or some areas could be doing some more heavy lifting. More things to look forward to um, in the near future. Uh, now, to come sort of more tightly to this idea of up, not out, or up and out, um, for all the talk of kind of going up, not out, we're still going out in quite a lot of areas. Judy, uh, your seat, um, we know Wilton, Appen, those big greenfield, um, big greenfield development sites, Wilton approved under the previous government, Appen just approved um, uh, under this government, although there is a review underway. Um, was that all a bad idea? Should we have done that? Um, I, I don't necessarily think it was a bad idea that we have gone out to an extent. What I do think is a bad idea is we've gone out with houses and roads. We haven't gone out with appropriate schools or health facilities or transport. So whilst we might be building affordable homes for people, um, it may not be affordable to live there. I would challenge anybody in this room to leave Wilton in 30 minutes and get to work or to a high school. 
it's impossible, or to a health facility, it's impossible. So it's not about the going out, it's about the infrastructure that needs to be there. And, and I'd like to look at alternatives as well. How many people in the Wallandilly electorate live on five acres or 10 acres or 15 or 100 acres and have road frontages where there is already some of the facilities that we talk about with power and water and all the rest of it? Why are we not looking at some infill in some of those peri-urban areas along where roads are? We can still have the rural outlook behind it if we do that. And that would make some of our farms more sustainable and our villages have people that can work and live in them and build communities. It's not about big developers coming in and flattening sites for, for you know, as far as the eye can see. We could actually have the best. This would be low hanging fruit. And I appreciate the fact that the minister now, the planning minister has an open door policy and is willing to listen to all these different alternatives. Okay, and, and Joshua, to come to some of your areas or necks of the woods, um, we heard Christopher earlier, uh, you know, why not get 50,000 in at uh, Olympic Park, 50,000 more people, build 10 more apartment towers at Parramatta. Um, yay or nay to that sort of idea? Well, I think it's a, a yay. Uh, uh, talking about the government-owned land, I think um, the member for Parramatta, Donna Davis, talked about expanding um, Parramatta Park into Cumberland Hospital. There's 20 hectares there to support um, the open space growth needed for the city of Parramatta. Um, this is all around the city. Um, there's so much um, government-owned land that we can use not just for housing but for open space and there's so much improvements that can be made to existing uh, public open space through improved infrastructure, night lighting, irrigation, um, infrastructure that will make them more resilient and more able to take more people uh, and improve the quality of gathering places for our communities. I'll, um, I'll sort of throw this one to anyone who's interested but I mean what about some other places uh, around the fringe of Sydney. Um, we heard a lot about Austral earlier today, uh, Marsden Park maybe, Gregory Hills, um, that require you know, so much new infrastructure. Um, should we have built them? Um, and now that we have, and now that we are, have we sort of locked ourselves into a bit of a bind where we've got to provide so much infrastructure in so many different far-flung places that we, we really can't do it properly? I guess the fact is you're asking the question now, but we continue to do it. Mm. So while we're going to have to retrofit some of those areas, we're continuing to spread westward and we're not addressing that problem right now with the lack of infrastructure. Yeah, I can answer this uh, from a perspective of a developer who does greenfield and, and infill development. And yes, we, we notice that we have uh, some of the sites that are being discussed and it is hard to get um, water infrastructure there. It is hard to convince Transport for New South Wales to, to build there. So we really should uh, make sure that we reimagine the way we live in Sydney. We really should look into the up and uh, you know, with the public open space that's, that's available, that was just mentioned. Um, I, I think we, there was a lot of discussion about the planning system today, Michael. But we need to think about what are the other hurdles of why are we not going up? You know, because in the end, the, the, the biggest hurdle that we see on our developments is community backlash. And that means that UP does not have the social license yet that it needs to have. So this is really the main challenge for all of us here in the room to, to, to work on that. Because community is not this foreign entity that, uh, that nobody understands. Community is actually all of us, right? It's all of us um, being afraid of the land values that we have or the homes, the value of the home that we have because if something happens in the surrounding area. We just need to all change that thinking. It's all on us. Of, of making up possible. And that's the conversation that, that I really would like to, to have, not just now, but, but in general with everybody, with everybody here in the room. Because um, we, yes, we're having this, this discussion here in, in Warwick Farm, but I'm pretty sure many of you live in these areas that you will say, we need more housing. I'm living in the lower North Shore. A lot of people would do the same in the eastern suburbs. And it's, it's real on us of, of just reimagining of what we want our neighborhoods to be and stop excluding people from these neighborhoods. 
And a lot of that's about having visibility of the program. So for the greenfields, it's about staging and sequencing and being really sensitive to those infrastructure needs. So we've seen a great announcement this week with a lot of schools for greenfield areas catching up on the enabling infrastructure. Now it's the population serving infrastructure. But with the rebalancing, the focus on um, housing around um, density, we don't have as good a visibility around that. It's much more ad hoc. And so setting up a system where we can get that understanding so that we can address those issues and better address them a few years out rather than getting the housing that people manage to get approved after three years. Um, you know, we need that, we really need to build that system. And I'll just add on that, we um, can do so much better with our design, um, the landscape and heritage values that we, some developments do them so well and some not so well, where we, where we um, go in and destroy the blue, blue and green grid and then move rivers and fill in dams and then only to rebuild them in new locations and plant trees that we've cut down. So I wonder if there's a challenge there that we can come in earlier and improve um, and some developments do that extremely well and this is the challenge as we continue to destroy the Cumberland Plain in Western Sydney, can we destroy less of it and make it more part of our everyday lives of new homes? And just in terms of what people want, I mean, we had the, the big rap from um, Renisha Clark just a moment ago on, um, uh, or before lunch, on, on Greenfield and the fact that, you know, it is still really kind of part of this idea of the Australian suburban dream. Uh, do people actually want to go up? Um, I know there's still, you know, uh, this idea out there about that, you know, that a lot of people hold about apartments being icky or, you know, you don't want to raise a family there, they're not the right place to raise children. Do people want to go up? I definitely say yes, because if we think about uh, many aspects of sustainability, we, we talked about that, about uh, um, being able to, um, to, to build new infrastructure. I think what we can show, and you look at, look at places like Marrickville and places like, uh, like Newtown and so on, that's where the life is, right? It's not, it's not further out. So I think uh, there is, there is a, and, and the minister referred as well to, to the younger generation. So from my perspective, I definitely say there is, and that's where our focus should be. And that is where you know, we will see to spend these 300 million as well. And we see it in the census data. You see we've got um, families now in apartments with uh, big numbers like around places like Parramatta. But it's about providing the product that makes that choice viable one. Three, four bedroom apartments, apartments that have play spaces in them, those sorts of things. But I think also some of the density is some more of the gentle density as well, where you might be going from single storey detached to you know three to six storey or that sort of infill that there's different ways to do density well that still gets you, you know, quite good yeah. outcomes. If, if I just may, may add to that about the human scale of it, because um, I'm originally not from Australia, so you may, may hear my accent. I'm from Germany and in Berlin, where I lived before, we are talking about, you know, maybe six stories, but very, very dense. And therefore you have, you know, schools, local shops, everything in walking distance. And that is a different livability that, you know, some parts of Sydney have already, and we can aspire to have this, have this more, and I'm very much looking forward to have this more on the North Shore. I might, just before you start, Judy, I might, because I, you know, I think you might be the most likely, I was going to ask, would anyone on the panel actually say, yep, all right, it's time for a moratorium on greenfield development? Me. <laughs> Go um, ahead. I, I would tell you politically that not all my residents, and I represent my community, especially as an independent, my community would probably say no to going up. Um, they would probably say no to increased density in greenfield sites. But at the same time, my community understand that there is a housing issue and they do understand that we're going to have these houses. What they don't understand is where these people are going to go to high school. We, you know, in, in this area as large as the Sydney metropolitan area, we have two public high schools and there is no new ones actually being delivered at this point in the new areas. We're not completing one of these areas before we're moving on to another area. We have, um, we have sewer being trucked out of some of the new developments still. We don't have a railway system that works. If we had, for example, if we had the Maldon on Barton line com you know, completed through from Wollongong to the new airport, then yes, let's get get on and, and put lots of housing there or high-rise. But at the minute, you do not have any 
public transport. You do not have any high schools. You do not have any health services. So my community are saying no, but I believe it's about choice and the people that are coming out to our areas are choosing to have the old fashioned block of land and specifically because um, they like the rural outlook, but that's not what we're going to end up with. Uh, and just, and well, we'll come to um, your questions in a moment, so do keep them uh, uh, going into the Slido there. Um, but you just reminded me of something, which is, you know, this idea, and I think we heard it mentioned earlier today, that um, NIMBYism is sort of like an Eastern Sydney problem, um, not a Western Sydney problem, no NIMBYs in Western Sydney. Uh, do we think that's true? And if so, to what extent? Josh, anyone? Anyone's free to jump in. I, I guess, um, you know, a lot of people move to the Wallandilly and to the Southern Highlands specifically to get that space and that rural outlook. And as I said, I see that there is the opportunity still to have some development on some of their land, not come in and wipe out masses of it that has been land banked. So there is an opportunity, but they do, yeah, they do like what they've got and they don't really want to share it particularly. I think um, we've got examples where we've done greenfield really well that shows how density can actually even work in a greenfield. And I think Edmondson Park that got mentioned earlier. We've got the train station. We've now got, you know, eight-storey buildings, uh, you know, six storeys, four-storey apartments. We've got an eight street. Like, it really shows what's possible when you have the infrastructure in at the same time as the development's coming. So there's, I also challenge us to reconceive how we think about greenfields and how it can be done in a forward-focused, more sustainable way than how it's been traditionally done. Yes, and just to add, the discussion about density is all about where to locate the density, and it's always, uh, and it is about transport nodes. I don't think we're talking about density in Wollandilly. What we're talking about is density around the metro lines, around the heavy rail line, and in other well-connected parts. And that's where, that's where the up should happen. I was just going to say there's NIMBYs and NIMBYs everywhere in um, the subcultures in each LGA, so I think it depends on what you're talking about and what you're looking at. Uh, but quality, I think, and um, choice and decision and transparency helps in those discussions. Um, and, and Josh, maybe you want to start with this. Like, I, I don't think we can ignore, uh, when we're talking about whether to build up or out, I don't think we can ignore the fact that you know, for most of the last week, um, in places like Western Sydney, it was more than 35 degrees, how does that impact the sort of choices that we might make when we're... Well, I don't know if anyone else woke up yesterday and thought, oh, thank God, it's cool now. Um, more people are now dying of um, heat-related stress than road trauma in Australia every year. And so we actually have a crisis. Um, and at the same time, um, we can address this through the provision of shade um, in our streets, you know, shaded streets that connect to parklands. Um, cooler places, and I think in a in a heat crisis, people do go outside. Uh, it's often much cooler outside. If people can't afford air conditioning or to, to run a cool home, um, they are going outside onto their streets and into their parks at night, and this is only going to get more and more extreme. So there's a huge role um, in addressing that over time. Uh, last one from me, um, Steph, uh, probably mostly to you. Um, with a, with a, just going back to the targets that are about to come down, I don't know, maybe it's just my obsession, um, but, you know, is there an acceptance now that maybe the last round of targets were too low? Um, and as we, as we just heard, half the time councils didn't reach them anyway. Was there sort of too much um, uh, space and weight given to councils and not enough sort of force being used to just say, hey, we're the state government and this is what you have to do. Yeah, look, a lot is made out of the targets. The targets are a tool that help us, you know, guide growth. Um, we were within, I think, about 5% of the five-year targets from 2016 to 2021. Um, you'd argue that the, all the changing uh, forecasts for growth and immigration, we need to be more agile about how we plan for growth. So having targets not just for the five years, but the 10 and 20 years as we're about to move to, sets us up that system where if, if growth uh, increases at a more rapid rate, you can pull forward supply. If it slows down, you're, you're able to slow down. But what's important about having that long-term supply is you're consulting with the community about where the housing's going to go. You're not having to make ad hoc decisions, knee-jerk, 
way. So moving to that programmatic approach is really important to being able to deal with growth and, and be more agile to respond to those um, demands. The bigger concern really, I think, in the last um, very, you know, last two or three years has been uh, the market downturn, dealing with the increased cost of materials and other um, constraints on supply. Because a lot of the capacity is there and indeed a lot of approvals are there. Um, it's getting them to convert to commencement. So getting more solutions focused about removing those barriers and impediments, that's where we really need to look at every single step in the pipeline so that they're all working. Okay, I think I'm going to be um, killed if I don't ask this question because so many people voted for it. Uh, but I'm conscious of the fact we don't have uh, a minister on the panel. Um, but uh, the question is, uncertainty about the outer Sydney orbital is stopping housing supply for families. Will the government commit to resolving the outer Sydney orbital alignment this year? Would anyone... <laughs> I like wish they would. <laughs> I wish they would, but I wish they'd actually communicate it to the community and have some community feedback in it, not just rule that this is where it's going to go. We have people building houses right where it's liable to have, um, you know, the, the major road go right past their house. They might have cows there at the moment, but they'll have streams of cars going in the future. Please commit on it, and I'll be pushing for them to get that, that commitment and the actual um, area it's going through. Okay, well, we'll need to get um, Paul Scully back to answer that one fully from the government. Um, uh, this one also very popular. How can government procurement processes be improved to get projects to market quicker? We don't have to answer. It's just, I'm, just, I'm just putting the people's questions out there, but if no one has an answer, we can move on. That's fine. I wasn't that interested in it either. Um, <laughs> How about this? I mean, this is more, um, uh, th this, this sort of really spoke to me. Elephant, the elephant in the room here is inertia in the bureaucracy, planning and infrastructure wise. It's just too easy to say no. How do we tackle this? Anyone got any ideas about that? Steph? Well, look, I think, um, as I've been saying, moving to a programmatic approach, and particularly with uh, GCC, WPCA, Department of Planning coming together, what we're going to have in one place, we've got e-planning looking at approvals, we've got the urban development program looking at those infrastructure priority lists, we've got the um, strategic planning and the targets to look at that longer term, having that pipeline where you can see each of those steps in the process is a big step. Um, towards that, to, towards unblocking those. I think that visibility around where the barriers and impediments are and, and calling them out sooner, but you've got to set yourselves up in the system so that that's actually going to work so people aren't pointing to others. Yeah. So I cannot talk for the bureaucracy, but I can talk for Lancome because we are a state-owned corporation, we're a commercial business, but uh, what we have, we have very clear goals. Very clear goals, priorities set by, by the Minister for Planning. And, uh, and Jack, Jacqueline Vossel was asking about the passion, and we have the passion as well. So from our perspective, we are, we are running. We have been running. Um, we are not waiting for anything. We have been running for a while, and we will continue running to, to be a big part of the, of the solution. Can I just quickly add to this question, because I was just having a discussion with um, um, uh, Ben Hendricks, actually, earlier at the beginning of this um, of the day, and he, who was suggesting, you know, um, maybe the area that, of the biggest breakdown within government is just that there are too many people uh, afraid to make a decision. Is that a problem, the biggest problem in your, everyone here has worked in government, um, is, is, is that a big problem? No one wants to make a decision? You can never please all the people all of the time. I think everybody would agree with that. And I think um, sort of going back a little bit, it's the siloing that happens in government and bureaucracy that makes things take a long time. Um, I can't talk for high rise, I can talk in Greenfield. I would love to see everybody sit around one table, this is what we're gonna get in a Greenfield, um, not just this developer and that developer, but everybody sit there, say, this is where the roads are going, this is where the school's going, this is where everything is. So everybody knows where that's going forward. At the moment, if you go to planning, they won't tell you where a school is. If you go to education, they won't tell you where the land is for the school. If you go to health and, and so on and so forth. But I think if we had a system where there's no silos, and it's either yes or no, this is where it's all going to be planned and everybody knows where it stands. 
Josh? I'd say in our agency it's not about decision making, it's coordination and I think Minister Scully has already talked about that and with Kirsten, uh, she is all about coordination so I can already see some of the changes coming in and it's going to take a little bit of time but it will filter down across the um, system. Okay. And I feel, would feel terrible if I didn't ask this, especially because um, she used her actual name, um, which I think is always worth um, bonus points. So very lastly, Steph, in the 50 seconds that we have left, what changes now that the Greater Cities Commission is under the Department of Planning, what does that actually mean practically? Look, um, as the Minister said, there's still a role for strategic planning. That's what the Commission's been doing, but we can do it in a more joined up way as part of the Department of Planning. Okay, terrific. And. Uh, Maybe I'll even, in the final 30 seconds, ask Rebecca Pinkstone's question, which probably deserves more than 30 seconds answer, but it's, um, research indicates that high-rise living can create a sense of social isolation. How do we consider that and deliver better outcomes as we go up? That's probably a whole other panel, but if anyone has any very quick answers on that. The right public open space, it's really, really key for that. Yeah, and go down to Rhodes if you haven't been down there and walk the waterfront every night. It's incredible. Rhodes good, yep. And so Rhodes is what to do and what's what not to do. Oh, I'm not going to declare that. Oh, <laughs> Does on. anyone else want to? <laughs> Fair it's, enough. It's quite well, close by to Rhodes. <laughs> we don't want to dive in anyone. Um, look, I'm conscious of the time, so um, please join me in thanking the panel. They've been wonderful.